So yeah, good afternoon and welcome to the uh, CSP seminar. Today is, uh, we are hurtling towards the end of the semester and I think everyone must be relieved with that. Um, anyway, uh, so I would want to first thank um, Shelly Felkam for all the organization behind it. I mean, I try to make it a point every time and it's not enough. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention that uh, again. So um, I also KLA and the two research groups for sponsoring this. So we're delighted to have uh, Christina Lee Yu from Cornell, who is our speaker today. So Christina is an assistant professor in the School of Operations Research and Information Engineering. Uh, prior to Cornell, she was a postdoc at the Microsoft Research uh, Center in New England. Um, I think she was based out of Cambridge, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> she received a PhD in 2017 and MS in 2013 in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from MIT in Leeds. So she worked with Devrat Shah and uh, for the most part, and also with Asura Tablai. She received her bachelor's in computer science from uh, Caltech in 2011. And she received honorable mention for the 2018 INFORMS Danzig Dissertation Award. Her research interests include matrix and tensor estimation, Martian bandits and reinforcement learning. And today's talk is on reinforcement learning, um, in particular, uh, looking at reinforcement learning for large continuous spaces. So Christina, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Vijay. I'm really happy to be here. And um, of course, wish I could be there in person, but hopefully there'll be a chance for an in-person visit in the future as well. But I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about this, um, this work. And also my uh, student, Sean, is actually also on the call. So, um, so, if, uh, so he'll also be able to field any questions throughout. So um, all right, so to start with the the context of the problem that we, the model that we're looking at is an, an agent inter, interacting with an environment through a Markov decision process. And in particular, um, how the interaction looks like is that um, this, the agent will observe, um, oops, okay, will observe the, the, say the initial state denoted X1. And as a function of this state, uh, the agent will choose an action A1 and this action is chosen um, according to a policy that the agent decides. And this policy pi one is uh, a function that maps from the states to the action space. Then as a function of the state uh, X1 and the action that was taken A1, the environment will produce some reward R1 and also the, the state of the environment will transition to a new state. Uh, and this state will transition according to some transition kernel T1. So, uh, this the um, if I knew all the dynamics of this um, uh, reward function of the model of the reward function the dynamics of the transitions, then we can uh, simply solve for the optimal policy. But the the challenge in reinforcement learning is that we're dealing with an environment that has an unknown uh, dynamics and rewards. So in particular here, we're looking at a, an episodic reinforcement learning setting where the agent is interacting with the environment over um, episodes and each episode is going to be length H and the, the episodes will repeat K times. And so we will assume that the, the, these uh, dynamics and reward are unknown. So the agent is trying to learn uh, the dynamics of the system while trying to optimize and figure out how does, how does he decide a good policy to collect good rewards without knowing in advance what the model is. Um, and we will assume a non-stationary setting where the reward function, the transition kernel, can uh, vary with uh, the step sites, uh, with the steps across the episode. Uh, so the the they will be denoted by this index h, little h. Um, the this overall uh, framework of, of reinforcement learning can be used to model uh, many applications. Perhaps the most popular being game playing and robotics. But in addition, um, there's many other sequential decision making problems we see in our everyday world, including uh, inventory control, control of queuing system, am ambulance routing, cache man management, and resource allocation. One particular application I want to call out uh, to form a motivation for uh, our problem is that of ambulance routing, in which your agent is a dispatcher uh, and the environment is um, can be represented in terms of the map of the city and the dispatcher needs to decide how to station uh, a set of multiple ambulances throughout the city. 
And throughout the course of the day, uh, requests of six patients arrive and they call into the dispatcher and the dispatcher must uh, send an ambulance to go and pick up the sick patient, take him to the hospital. And afterwards, the ambulance can be re uh, repositioned to a new location. And the goal of the dispatcher is to figure out how to manage the placement of these ambulances throughout the over the course of the day in order to minimize the um, delay of, uh, of, um, of uh, tra uh, traveling to these sick patients as they arrive, and also to minimize the transportation costs of re uh, repositioning the, the ambulances. Of course, the unknown piece of this model is that uh, the dispatcher doesn't know in advance um, what the distribution of these uh, pa patients that are that are they could be realized across this map over the course of the day, and in this case, an episode may be thought of a single day, and um, and so you can think of uh, over the course of the day, the distribution over the uh, the these sick patients actually varies across the uh, depending on the time of day, but it kind of resets at, at the beginning at end of every day. So um, this is kind of. Uh, one application I want you to keep in the back of your mind. But um, the, the challenge that we want to deal with today is a setting where when, uh, when our state and action space are continuous. So in particular, in our ambulance routing example here, um, you can think of the state space and the action space being represented as um, the, the locations of these amb uh, ambulances across the map. And because I could place the ambulance really along any, any point along the roads, um, the, the state space is actually continuous. Um, of course, when we look at a map, we know that uh, maybe I don't actually need to rep model as continuous because um, it may not make a big difference if I position the ambulance you know, in this particular location or maybe shift it over a few feet. And so in practice, you might think about just dis simply discretizing your map. So taking your road and chopping it into uh, discrete segments. Um, and this would, this would it'd be equivalent to uh, transforming your continuous model, your, your continuous markup decision process into a discrete model, which can model by a tabular markup decision process. And um, most naively, it's, uh, we can just use a uniform discretization. And um, often this epsilon, which is the, the discretization parameter is chosen to balance between the approximation error uh, that comes from the discretization and the cost of solving the tabular MDP. So if I have a very small epsilon, it means my discretization is fine, I can have low approximation error, but, but then my state space, my action space may be large. So the cost of sol solving this MDP could be large. But on the other hand, if I choose a large epsilon, uh, it, it will result in a very easy to solve MDP, but I may have a high bias and a high, uh, due to this approximation error. Um, another challenge with the discretization approach is that it can be very expensive in terms of the memory and sample complexity required. And so a key question of this talk is asking whether we can reduce the memory requirements um, of the algorithm while preserving performance. And uh, I, I want to also mention Christina, that- Christina, a quick question. When yeah. you say performance, uh, um, this is performance in terms of regret or in terms of sample complexity? I mean, what is the performance? Yeah. So we will, so actually there's gonna be two aspects of performance. So uh, I think, uh, well, actually no, regret and sample complexity, um, uh, we get bounds for both. We actually mostly regret though, in the sense of, we, we, we look at the regret at, um, of the algorithm and, and uh, provide bounds for that, but the bound on the regret can also uh, translate into a bound on sample complexity. Okay. Um, uh, but overall performance in the sense of you want the idea of, you just want your algorithm to be able to converge quickly to the optimal policy. Okay. Um, but yes, we will be looking at regret. So we're thinking of an online setting where you are penalized for, um, for uh, bad decisions along the way as you're learning. Uh, so an alternate approach to deal with continuous spaces, um, I just wanna kind of mention on the side is that you can instead also featureize your space and use parametric function approximators. So for example, um, uh, a common one would be to uh, assume that your underlying model or dynamics is linear with respect to some um, feature representation. 
of course, the challenge with that type of uh, uh, approach is that um, you you would need to know prior information about your model to figure out what is the right feature representation in which this linear assumption is actually uh, reasonable. And uh, and if it's not linear, then uh, you would you would have to incur model mismatch loss that is going to be linear in your uh, the number of steps in your um, uh, over your horizon, and so. We're, we're going to focus on the non-parametric setting. Um, all right. So today we'll look at the approach of adaptive discretization, which, which essentially constructs a data-dependent discretization of your space. And the key assumption on the model that we'll need is that the model is uh, Lipschitz with respect to the metrics, with, with respect to a known metric space. Um, uh, so you can think of this ellipsiousness assumption as being imposed on the reward function and the transition kernel, um, and that will be sufficient. Um, and the idea of the algorithm is that we would only refine the discretization on an as-needed basis. So, so if I take my, so essentially, I would take my continuous MDP, first find a very coarse discretization of my MDP into uh, a tabular MDP, which has perhaps a very high approximation error, but is very easy to solve because it's very small. And then after a, a, a certain amount of time when I collect enough data and I perhaps uh, learn something over the, this um, approximation, my first approximation, then I might refine my discretization uh, and produce a second uh, tabular MDP, which has lower approximation error, but um, a, um, a larger state in action space. And the hope is to uh, locally refine your discretization so that um, you generate a sequence of, uh, of uh, discretizations that eventually allows your algorithm to find the optimal policy, but without needing to over explore or over discretize in regions of the space that are suboptimal. And so one question would be, uh, is to ask if there is an optimal sequence of approximating MDPs and what's, uh, how should we um, decide when to uh, refine our, our discretization and where? And uh, this overall idea of adaptive discretization um, can be applied really to convert any tabular RL algorithm into an algorithm for continuous space. Uh, and so you can imagine once I figure out how to generate this sequence of approximating MDPs, then the actual uh, our algorithm in uh, within each one of these um, uh, finite state action space MDPs, I uh, can, sorry, I can use any uh, tabular algorithm to plug into each of these intermediate models. Um, okay. So um, I want to just refresh or introduce some notation of the model. Um, so again, re recall we're looking at an episodic setting where we have an agent interacting with the unknown MDP over uh, episodes of length H. So each episode is H steps and this episode is re repeat K times. So there's K total episodes. And our model, the unknown model parameters are going to be this reward function RH uh, and this is for a uh, little h from one to big H. So we have a reward function for each one of the, the big H steps. And the transition kernel, which maps from your state in action space to, uh, to a distribution over the state space. And uh, we will denote this uh, value function by V. Um, and here the subscript is the step within the episode and the superscript is the policy. So the value uh, function for a particular policy pi is defined to be the expected reward that this policy pi will collect um, starting at step H and at state X. So if the um, state of the system uh, is, is at X state X at time H, what is the expected reward that this policy pi will collect from time H all the way until the end of the episode until capital H. And the quality function or we'll, which we'll refer to as the Q function is simply um, a, a slight, a slight um, uh, only slightly different from the value function. Essentially, it's looking at if I uh, take action A at, uh, at step H, uh, and then for all subsequent time steps, I play policy pi, 
then what is my expected reward? And so this Q function represents the expected reward for playing this action. So it, it potentially may deviate from policy pi at step H and then from future steps, it will play according to policy pi. And, um, and the, the hope again is of the agent is to maximize its reward, which is equivalent to minimizing its regret. And the regret here is, uh, is the sum over all episodes of the, um, of the value of the optimal policy, that's pi star, uh, minus the value of the policy that was played by um, our agent. And um, uh, as a quick- so Christina? Um, yeah, go I ahead. Mean, in, in a way, uh, I mean, uh, so this, when you're, you're comparing to a static policy, right? I am comparing to a static, uh, a static policy, but think of actually pi star. Uh, I should say, pi star is a policy that's allowed. Uh, it specifies a policy for every step, so it, it's allowed to. Oh, okay, so it can be okay. That's fine. So it can be a time varying policy where it's looking at it's a stationary policy, nevertheless. In the sense, it's stationary as in it takes this current state and then applies based yes. on the time it applies something. Right? Yes, 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 yes. So uh, yes, thanks for the clarification. So, so this uh, optimal policy is going to be uh, actually a set of policies. It's gonna be a, a policy for each time uh, steps from one to capital H. Hi, hey, Christina, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, for the Lipschitz condition, uh, are you assuming the Lipschitz condition holds for all the policies you are considering? Uh, if you, so, um, so in terms of the so value function, to, Q function you get for like for each right. policy you have value function Q function right you assume the Lipschitz condition holds for all the policies right mm -hmm. um, we have uh, kind of two algorithms and two associated analysis one of them uh, does require a Lipschitzness assumptions on the reward function and the transition kernel and that will imply Lipschitzness for the value functions uh, for any policy. But um, if but but we also that we have two algorithms. The other algorithm doesn't actually require Lipschitzness for all policies. It only requires Lipschitzness on the 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 optimal Q function. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, I guess I'll point that out later. Um, yeah. Thanks for the correction. But uh, any any other questions about the model? Okay. No, I think that's good. Yeah. Please. Okay. So, uh, so in fact, if I knew the the reward function, the transition kernel, then I could actually solve for the optim, uh, optimal policy using dynamic programming. And um, the optimal policy satisfies this set of the development op optimality conditions here. And um, so you can here, I guess I'll uh, briefly uh, I guess I'll briefly go over them. The first one is is straightforward. It's, it's just that the um, any value function at step h plus one takes value zero because you're already at the end of the episode and you can't collect any more reward. And the second equation is simply the definition of the q function, kind of showing relative uh, being the uh, reward collect at this step plus the future value for playing that po the policy pi star. And the optimal the the key um, equation to satisfy is the third one here in that the, mm, the value function of the optimal policy at uh, evaluated at state X is going to be equal to the maximum uh, value across all actions of the Q function uh, evaluated at the state X and A. So meaning that um, if, it's, if, if this equation was not satisfied, then that means I could uh, find, I could improve my policy by choosing the action that in fact optimizes my Q function. Um, and so you can actually see then that the optimal policy is in fact a fixed point of this Bellman optimality, op, op, uh, Bellman optimality operator where you can see, uh, so here all I've done is kind of plugged in the definition of the Q function into the third equation here that if I had a, uh, say if I had a value function V the Bellman optimality operator essentially improves it, takes a one step Bellman update in which it computes the maximum action, uh, the, the action that maximizes a reward at every single uh, state where it uses the 
running value function v to approximate what your future value would look like in future steps. Uh, and so it would, it's kind of uh, this, this uh, operator improves, takes any value function for the uh, policy you have and improves it uh, if it's possible. And so if uh, your optimal um, policy, in fact, will be a fixed point of this operator. And so many algorithms either, uh, we'll, we'll look at two algorithms. One will be model-based algorithms, which essentially, uh, and then the other will be model-free. But the they essentially will look at either applying uh, fixed point. Clay, Clay has a question, I think. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, Christina, uh, just a clarifying question. So mm -hmm. pi star, does it operate on the continuous state action space? Yes, it does operate on the continuous state action space. Okay, and pi, each pi k operates on a discretized uh, or tabular state action space or something? Uh, like yes, so I'll actually, so right now here, um, I guess I haven't mentioned how the discretization will look like yet, um, but, but Yes, in our setting, our pi k's are going to operate on the discrete space, and then our pi, but we'll be comparing against pi star, which is operating over the continuous space. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, and so, uh, all right, so I think what, what I want to do next is kind of mention that uh, there's the main format of our algorithm, which is the overall idea of adaptive discretization, but really, we apply it to two specific um, uh, two specific realizations of the algorithm. One will be a model-based algorithm. One will be a model-free algorithm. And so then I will present each of those algorithms uh, in turn. Um, but first, I, I guess in, in order to introduce it, I want to uh, we'll first look at what these uh, model-free and model-based algorithms look like in the discrete space. Um, but um, our adaptive algorithm essentially maintains a partition of the state and action space that's refined over time in a data-driven manner. And given the current partition, it, the current partition will translate into a finite state and action space MDP. And on that finite space uh, MDP, we will run under the original tabular algorithm. There is a little bit of tweaks that's required, but I'll um, kind of point them out as we go. And here you can plug in, there's uh, either model-free RL algorithms or model-based algorithms. And I'll mention what that means in, a, in just a moment. And the key thing we need to figure out is how to refine our, our partition. And what we do is to start partition a region of our, uh, when it has been chosen too often, and this too often is going to be defined in terms of when the confidence radius is smaller than the bias. So this is in fact a very natural splitting rule because um, it's this particular the threshold at which the uh, new data points um, will help reduce the confidence radius but don't reduce the bias. Uh, and so when the confidence radius becomes smaller than the bias, that's precisely the point in which you need to uh, further refine that region of the space in order to uh, make improvements on your estimate, uh, because otherwise your bias will dominate there. And we'll see that in fact, this is this is the, uh, well, this seems to be the, the right splitting rule to use. Um, and this, there have been similar existing heuristics that um, that do that do uh, empirical work, uh, testing out different kinds of splitting rules. Um, uh, but a large part of our contribution is um, is showing the analysis for this algorithm. So there are two, uh, I would say, two overall um, types of RL algorithms: um, model based and model free. And model based algorithms are uh, is probably easiest to, easier to explain, so I'll start with this one. And first I'm gonna describe what the model-based algorithm looks like for finite state action spaces, uh, 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 settings. So um, the model-based algorithms maintain empirical estimates for the reward function, the transition kernel. Um, so in the discrete setting, then uh, the reward function, the, the estimates for the reward function is, uh, ma uh, is simply stored in a matrix and the transition cor corresponds to a tensor. A transition kernel is stored in a tensor. And, um, and given these empirical estimates, 
you simply take them and plug it into the Bellman equations, solve the and can solve the dynamic program via backwards induction or fixed point iteration. But um, the one thing I'm, I'm sweeping under the rug is that um, because these estimates uh, could be very bad initially, um, you don't. You also need to uh, kind of add a bonus term or to cap to capture what's the uncertainty of your estimates um, and. Many algorithms will use optimism to encourage exploration um, when your estimates are not very uh, are, are not very accurate yet. And so here, these Q hat R hat. Uh, so R hat is denoting our estimates for the reward function simply the empirical. This E hat is denoting that I'm taking expectation with respect to the empirical um, uh, distribution that we've collected so far for the from the transitions we've observed. And that corresponds to an estimate uh, of our Q function and our value function. Um, and so this is the overall uh, like form of a model-based algorithm. And essentially what we will, our uh, adaptive discretization algorithm needs to figure out is how do we, um, how do we manage these estimates for the reward function and transition kernel when you're in a continuous space? Um, let me... Okay, uh, so I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna pin this here and we'll come back to the model based in just a moment. Um, the other type of algorithm is called a model free algorithm. And where what makes it model free is that you're not actually explicitly learning these reward functions or the transition kernels. Instead, you're uh, directly, we directly estimate these value functions. So the Q functions and the associated value functions. Um, the algorithm will play optimally relative to these estimates on the value, but because we can't compute the expectation in the Bellman operator for the next, the transition to the next step, instead we'll use these single data point uh, updates with, uh, with appropriately chosen step sizes. So here our step size is alpha, and you can see that the update, what this uh, here, what I'm showing is the Q learning update where you have um, our estimate Q hat, and the update looks like I, I, a convex combination between the old estimate and, um, and this estimate of the, the Q function using just the data point, the single data point that I observed in this point, in, in this time step, which is the reward I collected in this time step and the, uh, and, and, uh, the, the value function evaluated on the single state that my system transitioned to. Um, and again, we'll, we'll use optimism to encourage exploration. So the model free Q learning algorithms um, is essential, uh, is um, easier to start with for uh, introducing our adaptive algorithm. So let me show you, I guess, how, how our uh, adaptive partition works in the Q learning setting. So our algorithm here is called uh, ADAQL for adaptive Q learning. It maintains a partition and so uh, of the state in action space. And here I've depicted on the left, a setting where our state space is the unit interval and the action is the unit, unit interval as well. Um, and so the boxes here depict uh, an example of what the partition might look like. And at, at all times, our algorithm will maintain um, upper confidence bound estimates of the Q function for each region of the uh, partition. And a key property our, um, our analysis will show is that the, with high probability, these, Q, these UCB estimates, uh, Q hat, uh, are in fact valid upper bounds on the Q function uh, of the optimal policy for any point in, the, uh, in this region, any point in this uh, box. And our selection rule is simply to select the relevant region with the largest UCB Q value. And so um, when, our, let's say a state XH arrives um, at step H, um, I look at this dashed line uh, showing me the, all the regions of my partition that intersect with this state. And I, I uh, play, I choose the region of my partition for which the uh, Q hat values, so this UCB estimate of the Q function is the largest. And once I've selected a region, I can play any action uh, in that region. Um, so one nuance is that, you know, uh, given this partition, um, sometimes we may, th that uh, across for a particular state X, 
uh, it may intersect with regions of different sizes. Um, and given, so after we've chosen a action and collected some data point, how we update estimates is, uh, is simply, it looks just like the Q-learning update rule, where instead of updating estimates on individual state action pairs, now I'm updating estimates of entire regions of my partition. So if I chose this region B, H, um, then I update the, this estimate Q hat for that uh, region of my partition, according to, again, a, a convex combination between my previous estimate and my estimate given this particular data point. Uh, so here, I'm going to, again, look at the uh, reward that I collect plus the my estimate on the value function evaluated at the state that my uh, algorithm transitioned to. And this value function is, uh, it is simply chosen to be the maximum um, the maximum Q function for any region that intersects with that this state. So again, I'm looking at XH plus one where my the next state I transition to, and I look at the maximum Q function for any region intersecting with XH. Um, so to pause here, um, the Q, I just want to emphasize our Q function and the value function are defined, uh, the Q function is defined over the uh, partition and the value function is defined over all of our the entire continuous state space. But the value function here will be, in fact, stepwise constant uh, because the Q function is uh, also piecewise constant. So there's a uh, question by Lei, I think. Lei, go ahead. Uh -huh. uh, Christian, so uh, when you adapt the, uh, the discretization, mm -hmm. do you need to recompute all the Q function or update the Q function based on the previous values? No, in fact, we don't need to recompute. We uh, actually, that's my next slide. In fact, the way what we, when we, um, uh, when, uh, so, so, uh, sorry. So previously, this is uh, showing the update when, when uh, for my current fixed partition. But how we decide when to uh, change the partition is when uh, this splitting rule is satisfied. So this particular splitting rule is, oops, um, right. Uh, we substitution when uh, this region has been chosen too often. So this splitting rule will, will roughly correspond to when the confidence radius is smaller than the bias. And, how, and after I split the partition, uh, the new regions, so the children um, will just inherit uh, all the estimates and counts from the parent, part uh, parent region. Um, and so if I have this large box here and it's split into these four, four boxes, each of these small regions will just inherit the uh, same Q hat value as the large box. Okay, thanks. And in, uh, and also I, I under the transition probability as well. Uh, so in this um, in this algorithm, the Q learning algorithm, we actually don't um, uh, store the transition probabilities. We only store uh, mm -hmm. counts of how many times the region has been uh, visited and um, and the estimate on the Q hat. Uh, so like if I divide it into small regions, right? If you store the counts, you store the counts for the bigger region or you also have detailed uh, memory about exactly which small region like that. Yeah, so how do you divide the counts? Yeah, I think that was the, the question. The counts was... also are inherited. So in fact, um, you should think of, so uh, maybe I, I, I slightly, this sentence is a little bit of a lie in that NB is not only the number of times this region has been selected, you should think of it as actually the number of times this region and its ancestors have been selected. Okay. So, uh, and in fact, th that's a good point that, um, so because we don't, we, uh, in fact, you can inherit all the values, inherit the, the counts. So the um, estimate Q hat here, it actually contains um, data points that are from, uh, from uh, ancestor regions. <laughs> Uh, ancestor balls of, of this region B. So meaning that this yellow box um, here, his ancestor region was this large upper left quadrant. And so in the estimate Q, uh, Q hat of this region, this yellow region, um, it actually contains data that could have been sampled from the larger upper left quadrant region as well. So in fact, it's in that sense, um, you have to be careful uh, to handle that in the analysis. 
So even in the uh, model-based case, you are doing the same? Because in, I, yes, I even in the model-based, we are also doing the same. But in the, in the model-based case, you will store the transition probability. That's part of your model, right? Yes, we will. And then you will inherit all the transition probability from the... Beginning. Yes, we will also inherit, yes. Okay, okay great, thanks. Yeah, um, so actually we'll, we'll move on to the model-based now. Uh, so. But, but the last comment on this uh, model free Q learning algorithm is that this um, algorithm at a QL, you can think of it as approximating this Q function with a regression tree. So um, in fact, the previous existing, uh, the previous um, heuristic paper was actually looking at exploring different types of splitting rules. Uh, but interestingly, the splitting rule that does well is in fact the splitting rule that, um, that, uh, that we propose that, that, which has kind of a, a very well-founded theoretical basis. Um, and a quick note on this, um, uh, oh, okay, actually, I think I should move on. <laughs> um, all right, so, so next I'll, I'll want to mention what's different about the model-based version of the algorithm. Um, so as Lei mentioned, we will also have to keep track of additional quantities for the model-based version, uh, where we actually keep track of the estimates of the rewards and the transitions across the state and action space. So here, the so the reward function is, is more straightforward. It's defined over the partition. But the transition, uh, the estimates of the transition kernel is defined over mappings from a region in the partition to subsets of the state space. Um, uh, okay, actually, I'll, I'll go to this slide first. And the, in particular, the, the transition function that we estimate will be uh, defined over, we're estimating the transition from say a ball B to a uniform discretization of the state space up to the precision of this ball. So in particular, if I have a region that's very large, then when I'm estimating, um, let's say this, the T hat uh, sub H associated to a large region, the range, uh, so it will map to a um, regions of the state partition that are very coarse versus if I'm um, looking at uh, the estimate of the T hat for a small region, um, a smaller box, then it's going to, then we're going to keep track of the transition kernel up to a, a closer precision up to um, <clears throat> these kind of smaller boxes. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. And, and this is because we want to, our, in our analysis, we want to ensure that the accuracy of our estimates uh, in, in, in different locations are roughly proportional to the diameter of the region. Uh, and so the, in particular, we want the estimates of associated to this ball and estimating his value um, function to be roughly proportional to its diameter. Uh, but for a large region, I'm, uh, we're allowing more error because there's already inherent bias due to the to the uh, due to kind of the the uh, the size of the uh, the radius of this ball, um, and and so uh, and the 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 kind of. Uh, I think there's a on one hand, if I have a small region like this yellow ball B here. Um, if I look at this discretization on the bottom axis here, it's actually keeping track of the transitions to a finer, uh, finer degree than the um, than the associated partition of that part of the state space. Uh, versus, uh, if I'm looking at um, a large um, ball, a large region here, it actually. Um, even though the left side of the state space has been already partitioned to smaller regions, the uh, transition kernel we are storing for the large boxes, in fact, uh, throws away that extra precision. Um, and so this actually uh, limits the storage complexity for the estimate. So if we, mm, given the uh, kind of current partition, uh, you, the, you can kind of look at how much storage required is, is directly uh, related to um, how many boxes of different sizes uh, in your partition. Um, and also refer to what's called the induced state partition uh, is going to refer to the projection of my partition onto the state space. So uh, kind of looking at uh, these, pulling down these dashed lines here. So my showing any region that has been partitioned already across any part of the action space 
Um, and this induced state partition is used for uh, when we're calculating our value function. Um, when, so once we have our estimates, we will use, you can use either full plan, uh, Bowman updates or one-step planning to estimate the Q function and value function. Uh, and so, but here now we're evaluating it over the partition. Uh, so our, uh, I guess the uh, plugin for the Q hat uh, function is fairly straightforward. For the compute the value function for, a, uh, we define the value function over uh, regions in the induced state partition. And this is because uh, our, our transition E hat here, uh, it, th this, um, sorry, this, this is computed with respect to these empirical um, estimates and the most uh, fine, and they will kind of map to uh, balls A that are uh, subsets of this um, partition. And uh, so this A is actually could be finer than our induced state partition, but essentially you're going to look at uh, for any region in our induced state partition that in, includes this um, uh, ball A, what's the maximum uh, um, Q value? Sorry, that was a little bit a little bit messy, but um, but essentially uh, you're looking. Uh, but but I think one way to think of it is sufficient is to that, that if you look at the um, the in the transition estimates, it's sufficient to think of it as um, keeping track of transitions to the induced state partition. And this is because our Q function is only um, stored up to a precision of the induced state partition, so it only really matters up to that value. Um, and uh, so our selection rule is that we select a relevant region with the largest UCBQ uh, value. And now the last part, the splitting threshold will follows the same idea where we set partition when the confidence radius is smaller than the bias and the new regions all inherit all, uh, all the estimates. So then inherits the estimates of the, the, the counts, the transitions, as well as, as, well as the rewards. Um, and uh, uh, so one thing I want to point out here is that this threat, this splitting rule now is actually depends on the dimension of the state space instead of uh, in the model free version, this was just a two. In the model based version, this is the dimension of the state space. And this is because um, our confidence radius, um, so this bonus term here uh, actually comes from um, uh, from, from uh, characterizing the, the uncertainty in our estimate of the transition kernel. And, um, and because we're trying to, uh, since we need to, we, we guarantee uh, convergence on uh, of this uh, oops, of this distribution t hat over the uh, state space, then it will have an additional um, uh, dependence on the dimension of that state space. Um, okay. Uh, any questions about the algorithm? This is a good time to pause. And um, I think. Uh, what Ling asked was a really good point in that because our algorithm only inherits the estimates, in fact, a lot, um, it doesn't require you to store um, the memory of all, all the samples collected thus far. So if, if I needed to um, figure out what were only the, um, the data points selected in this box in the past, then I will need to uh, in fact, store every single data point, and some of the uh, other algorithms can, in fact, have this property for a lot of the continuous state uh, space. Uh, uh, for example, the the uh, equivalent kind of kernel-based approaches, uh, and so a benefit of our algorithm in terms of um, memory savings is that you really only need to store up to the precision of the partition. Yeah, uh, Christina, if I may, uh, maybe I can yeah. ask a follow-up question or. Uh based yeah. on your comment. Mm -hmm. So if we are just inherent the, like the parent parameter, especially the transition probability, mm -hmm. uh, then you like from the data, if the transition probability or the data actually come from one subregion, right? Not yeah. uniformly distributed region. Then when you inherit that transition probability, then for the other subregions, that transition probability could be very wrong. Yes. Uh, can you give us an intuition of why the algorithm uh, like can solve this issue, like well, why this is not issuing your algorithm? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think 
the way I would think of it is that um, is that the the splitting rule, in fact, enforces uh, if almost exactly how much time you're spending in every level of the uh, of this hierarchy tree structure you're building. So many, and and in fact, the uh, let's say in, in the simple case when let's say DS is two, um, like the the number of time you're and the diameter you should think of it as um, two to uh, let's say here one half to the depth or two to uh, yeah to the depth of the. Um, Oh, okay, sorry, let me pause, <laughs> roll back. So you can think of our partition as constructing, being constructed by a tree. And so what's important is actually the, the, um, the depth of the region in your partition in this tree. And so the depth has to do with how many times it's split. And the depth will exactly translate to the, both this diameter. Uh, and in fact, the number of times that that a partition is selected before it's split along each depth of this tree kind of grows, um, uh, let's say doubles each time. So imagine every time my diameter um, uh, is uh, divides by two. Uh, and so actually not just doubles actually. So it divides every time in a subsequent, my child has half my own diameter. And so if you look at what's the number it needs to satisfy until this threshold is, uh, satisfied, it will be two to the uh, DS. Um, and so this is, I'm, I'm slightly sweeping something under rogue because N, N is um, not only the number of times I've been chosen, but the number of times my ancestors have been chosen. But because of the fact that it's like two to the DS, um, the, uh, the, this N number of times that um, a region has been selected is, is going to be dominated by the most recent um, level. Uh, in that basically the you in the very first estimate you get um, when you initialize is going to be um, a little bit off, but you're going to stay in that region long enough that um, that the new data points coming in is going to overwhelm all your old data points. Okay, I see. And and, uh, do you also use the fact like the transition kernel is Lipschitz so that the distribution over like subregion is more or less even use some concentration? Yeah, so in the model-based version, we need the Lipschitz on the transitions uh, and the rewards. Mm -hmm. In the Q learning version, we only need Lipschitz on the Q star function. I see, okay. Actually, I had a question on that. The sum, I mean, so your assumption in some sense for the transition kernel is, um, is the support for any state an action? I mean, there's some assumption of the support, right? You cannot um, have very extreme sparse. I mean, there's basically, you cannot have regions um, where basically you cannot take certain actions. You cannot have zeros in some spaces in a way. Uh, well, we, we assume uh, Lipschitzness in terms of Wasserstein distance on the okay. transitions. So we are allowing, um, allowing zeros. But in the sense of uh, if so, as in I can have two, I can have a deterministic, we are able to de handle deterministic transitions. So you have a lot of zeros. In fact, the transition is actually deterministic. Uh, but for, but we, well, you, but, but to satisfy the Wasserstein, um, Lipschitz and Wasserstein uh, distance, you'll need that, you know, states that are nearby, they transition to states that are nearby. Okay. But it's, so, okay. Yeah. Well, I guess this, I mean, yeah, it's fine. Please, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, continue. Yeah, sorry. I think I, I sort of get what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you can think of, well, yeah, but but because um, uh, the Lipschitzness, it kind of translates into um, uh, because if if I have uh, um, Lipschitzness in terms of Wasserstein, it's uh, you can think of it as um, uh, because I can move the mass. Um, only a small distance to transform from one distribution to the next. And furthermore, I'm evaluating um, these expectations with respect to a value function that it itself is also Lipschitz. Um, then it preserves kind of uh, the fact that our estimates uh, for regions nearby are going to also satisfy the Lipschitzness. Uh, okay, and uh, um, okay. 
So we do uh, show regret bounds uh, for, for both the Q-learning algorithm and the model-based uh, algorithm. Um, one, I guess one thing I want to point out is that in the Q-learning algorithm, the dependence on the number of episodes K in fact matches the lower bound uh, from contextual bandits. Um, and the, the, in fact, the bound we get for the model-based setting um, is actually the best regret, uh, best dependence um, in the, in terms of, uh, of uh, the other literature for continuous spaces uh, when you look at the dependence on K as well. Um, but you can see that there is a gap in terms of the, um, the Q-learning algorithm has a better uh, dependence on K than the model-based version. And this is, um, we believe it's because the, um, the analysis probably that requires uh, uniform concentration of the transition kernel incurs this extra cost in terms of the dis dimension of the state space. And that part of it is probably loose. I, th I think it's probably loose, <laughs> although it's up, up, up in question. Um, and there is follow work, work after ours that um, in fact shows gap dependent bounds. And so what I mean by gap dependent in continuous spaces is that the uh, instead of depending on the dimension of the state and action space here, D, you can replace this D with the what's called a zooming dimension. And this zooming dimension is in fact um, a dimension that is specific to the instance, um, which is uh, it's a function of the particular value function of the model. Um, so I'm actually, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going <laughs> to zoom through the rest. Um, the, the proof, it has three parts. Essentially, you show concentration um, using martingale concentration uh, results, and then we, um, the regret decomposition, the key property is to show that this diameter of the region is roughly the same order as the bonus term, so the uncertainty. Um, and, and this come, this has to do with the exact splitting rule that we choose. And, and furthermore, you can show that the regret decomposes as a sum of these bonus terms. Um, and so the regret then directly translates to um, a function of these diameter of the regions in your partition. And then we, you, you can uh, use the LP duality to get bound the size of the partition and these bonus terms. Uh, but in particular, you, you can show that the worst case instance is the one that forces you to do uniform discretization. So uh, uh, any um, uh, model which has more structure that uh, where the value function varies more uh, is going to do better than uniform. Uh, so we, we, we have some uh, pretty images and uh, PJ, actually, I realize I'm quite running out of time. What do you think? You could do one of the examples. I think it would be good to do okay. that. I'll show one example. Um, and this is uh, for, for making it easier to visualize. Um, the state and action space is chosen to be unit interval. And, all out, and this is a oral discovery problem, which is a continuous version of the grid world problem, where you have an agent surveying a map in search of hidden oil deposits. And, um, and there's a cost for transportation and also uh, a reward for this survey. And so here, uh, this picture, what is de depicting is I picked a particular step within the episode and the um, plot, the color code is actually uh, reflecting the Q function uh, the, the, uh, of the optimal policy. Green denoting high value, red denoting low value, and the boxes on top is it shows the um, partition that our algorithm generates. And the left one is the Q learning algorithm, the right one is the model based. And you can see that the partition in fact does seem to um, refine the discretization in regions of high value and keep coarse estimates in regions of low value. And you can see here when we look at our uh, rewards and the sizes of the partition that uh, on the right side, you can see the, the our algorithm, we compared it with the epsilon uniform discretization. Um, that we have significant savings in terms of memory. And uh, on the left, you can see we actually converge much faster. So our algorithm is the red and the blue algorithm and uniform uh, discretization is the green and the orange algorithm. Um, and we can see essentially these, uh, the, the same uh, intuition is reflected in uh, multiple results. You can see this one, the even nicer, it's a case when the, the, the value function is extremely peaked and as a result, the uniform uh, discretization performs very poorly and never converges. But our algorithm is able to find um, this very uh, narrow region of high reward. Um, okay, so 
and, and, and we also showed that uh, kind of compared the, the running time of our algorithm against epsilon net. And um, you, we, our algorithm um, uh, performs much faster. And in fact, it gets more savings when you look at in higher, higher uh, dimension uh, problems. Okay, so um, I'll pause here and um, happy yeah, to- so Thanks a lot, Christina. So there are two discussions. So I will, uh, oh, actually there's a question. So let, let uh, Clay go, go. Clay, go ahead with your question. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. And um, I have a high level question. I'm just curious how the, uh, does the adaptive partition problem that you discussed, does it change the way we should think about the exploration exploitation trade-off? And, uh, you know, for example, uh, does it lead us to explore more than we might otherwise uh, with a non-adaptive partition? Exactly. I think, well, actually, I think it's the other way around, actually. Oh, okay. I would say um, a non-adaptive partitions explore more because uh, they will like grid the, the um, take the, the state space and grid it into regions where there's certain regions it, it, it discretizes too much. And those regions, it has a heavy cost for all the exploration you need to do because you discretized it finally, as opposed to if you just like blocked it into a single region, you wouldn't have to sample as many times to get an estimate on it. So by adaptively discretizing, you're actually saving exploration. Uh, you're, you're reducing exploration in regions of low reward and, and, uh, and kind of shifting them to learning in regions of high reward. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I'm, I guess I'm also wondering, do you explore a region um, knowing that you might be able to subdivide it uh, further? I don't know if that's... Um, uh, no. So our algorithm, in fact, the, the splitting rule is done per, fully in a data-dependent way. So it actually doesn't know in advance uh, which regions are high value or low value, which regions it's going to split. It only the only rule is if I visit a region a lot, then I'm going to split it. And 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 it turns out that because of the um, the uh, this optimistic um, um, selection rule, where you're, uh, but also the way that you're making sure that your estimates are are kind of uh, converging well, that your your policy is going to naturally shift towards regions of high value. And as it spends more time in high value regions, is going to partition those regions more. So it doesn't know in advance which parts is going to. Uh, yeah, it wasn't so much a question Actually, about. Clay, Clay, can you take this afterwards? Maybe we can proceed further to the discussion. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me let me just uh, say one thing. I, I wasn't. It wasn't a question about your algorithm, but more the setting. Mm -hmm. But yes, we we can discuss it. Uh, mm -hmm. We can discuss it more offline. All right. Oh, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, so I think we can go with, uh, we have two discussions here. So let's go with uh, Hang Hao uh, Wei first. I think Hang Hao, you're a co-host. You should be able to present something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me share my screen. Oh, can I see my screen? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I really enjoyed the, this talk. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Yi. So uh, basically this talk uh, uh, provide, pro proposed a efficient model-based and uh, model-free algorithms for the large state action space. Uh, so it describes the uh, state action space in this driven way and uh, uh, so as to minimize the regret. And the algorithm requires the light assumptions and doesn't require access to the simulation oracles. And the bonds uh, achieved are uniform, uniformly better than the best resulting bond for uh, model-based re reforms and learning in continuous space setting. So uh, actually, my question here is uh, uh, in some, some work that's like uh, also in the model-free uh, algorithm, the learning rate was chosen as the alpha t equals to h plus plus one uh, divided by H plus T. Um, but uh, in the, uh, at, the um, at the model based algorithm, like uh, uh, the algorithm updates the Q value directly. And uh, uh, so, I'm, uh, so I'm wondering, so uh, 
is that is that a guarantee like a uh, update stick directly is, works better than using a uh, uh, learning rate because even i think in some model based algorithm they also use the uh, uh, learning rate uh, to update the q value mm -hmm. and uh, the second question is uh, uh, oh, so that question mostly in the simulation, uh, in the algorithm perspective. So the result of the final discretization has some connection with the adaptive tail coding. Uh, so I think in that case, they divide it, they divide the region uh, based on the, the accumulated TD errors of that region. But uh, in the, here the algorithm, it divided, uh, it divided the region based on how many times the, the region was hated. So mm -hmm. I was wondering like uh, maybe for some region it, uh, it was hated so much, but uh, uh, the change of the Q value may not uh, very large. So uh, if uh, we, we, we divide it already in another way, will that uh, help or not? And also like for the transition kernels, so uh, because uh, when we divide uh, uh, some reg some region and all the uh, child regions will inherit the uh, transition kernel from uh, their parents, uh, but we can we uh, I mean this is in the algorithm perspective. So can we like maintain a hidden layer? So when we divide the uh, region, then uh, the sub regions can can inherit not only from the parent region, but uh, from the hidden layer. So uh, the, then the, in that case, the transition kernels uh, may more accurate than, than the parent's region. And the third question is, uh, so any comments on the model-based and the model-free method in the continuous settings? Because I think in the uh, simulation perspective, they, the performance they are they are they seem the same they, they may have the same performance i think mm -hmm. yeah That's yeah a, um, a question yeah a great questions um uh so i guess the first one the learning rate in fact the for our q learning algorithm we do use the same learning rate also motivated from the previous um uh, literature. And I think yeah. the reason why that's needed for the mm -hmm. model free version as opposed to the model based version is that we're actually storing uh, less estimates so that um, uh, if I was, if I actually stored every single data point in the past, in some mm -hmm. sense, I could actually um, uh, think of if I updated my empirical and my estimates of my value function, then I, in some sense, the, the ADA MB, the model-based version can be somewhat uh, written in, in a form that looks like the Q-learning update, but with a step size only one over T, but with updates, but, but where, um, where I'm actually tracking the uh, kind of uh, um, the, the empirical, the, the mm, where I'm actually updating my uh, my when I'm evaluating the future value, I'm actually using the current estimate of the value mm -hmm. function. Okay, that was a little bit convoluted. Let me try again. But but essentially, the um, I think the reason why the model free version needs to add this extra h is because you actually want to slow down the learning because you don't want to um, over bias towards the single recent point. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so in the Ada MB, you don't need to um, slow it down because you're actually already uh, tracking the estimate of the full transition kernel. So you don't actually need to um, slow down the rate. You're actually, it, the, the model-based one in theory, because you're actually storing the extra estimates, um, uh, the, the computation, um, uh, full, fully, the full computation of the, the um, optimal policy given those estimates is actually a better, uh, more accurate than using um, this lower learning rate. That's kind of my opinion. But um, and so I would say the alpha t is because the the model free versions are limited in the data stored. The second problem um, okay, that's yeah. actually uh, about the, the adaptive mm -hmm. tile coding. That's a really um, good suggestion. We actually uh, we have not compared with those um, splitting rules, and that's actually something uh, I will definitely look into. It. So John's going to take notes on this. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you for the suggestion. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I quite understood what this hidden layer of the... Uh, 
it's like uh, so even for some parent region like uh, when we calculate the transition kernels mm -hmm. uh there are some different if they further divide it into four parts and there are some if so once once when we divide the oh uh, like some store, region have this parent store finer uh estimates yeah something ah so we had um so the reason why we do that is 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 primarily actually to save the um, memory so that you yeah can... yeah I see yeah and, and this is because uh, when I'm um, let's say I'm in a parent region and I'm trying to figure out do I need to store any finer locations of the samples I'm getting is I don't know uh, how fine I might need to store because it, it it could be that this region is going to end up being very finely discretized and then that might actually force my hand to need to store every single data point um, mm -hmm. and so because you don't necessarily know like up to what level should I store. Uh, so we uh, we don't do that for the purpose of, of saving memory and that it turns out that uh, in terms of order up uh, the um, uh, like how much you can gain by um, tr by inheriting your parents estimates or or even wiping your slate completely clean. It's really only a constant. So in terms of our, our results, everything would go through exactly the same and the order would be exactly the same in terms of the regret bounds. If mm -hmm. instead, when I created a new region, I completely reset um, the estimates and I made the estimates uh, take the you know very loose upper bound and I reset my count to zero. Um, okay, I see. In fact, yeah. if I reset mm -hmm. my count to zero, uh, uh, I mean, algorithmically, it sounds like, well, I mean, it, it, it will actually perform slightly worse empirically, mm -hmm. but um, in terms of the regret bounds, it's going to scale the same way because it ends up only being a constant factor. And this has to do with Lay's question that it's mm, the amount of time you spend in, a, in that region is like enough to overwhelm whatever you initialize it with. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see. Uh, the, uh, the last comment, um, that's a good question in terms of the this discrepancy between model based and model free. It's actually a question on our minds too because um, I think when we looked at I think in the um, discrete case, people tend to feel like oh model model based should do better because you're I mean converted faster because you're um, estimating the transition. So you so once your transitions start to converge, then everything locks in as opposed to model free might take longer for that information to propagate through your estimates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but in the continuous case, it's not as clear because the um, the cost for estimating your transition kernels in the model based um, algorithm is actually very high, and it and it forces your algorithm to like because your uh, bonus terms then are larger, your your uncertainty is larger. It, mm -hmm. um, it kind of forces your hand to um, to split the regions much slower and spend a longer time in exploring before you uh, like before you refine. Uh, and so there is a bit of a tension there. And I mean, I think when you when we looked at different uh, instances of our uh, simulations, it wasn't always clear which one was a winner. So um, empirically, it's not, uh, we don't really have a guess. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, Hongho. Uh, maybe yeah, so so Su, Su is yeah. next, yeah, so yeah. Su yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. No? Okay. Yeah. So I just uh, went through, uh, go through a, <clears throat> a very brief overview again. So the key assumptions in um, these works are uh, they assume a matrix exists in the state action space such that the, <clears throat> the, the diameter of that state action space is finite and um, <clears throat> They assume the transition kernel as well as the uh, reward function for the um, for the eta MB case or the optimal Q function for the uh, eta QL case are Lipschitz, and um, <clears throat> uh, they they assume that the the learner has the complete information for the uh, the above information. So the key components of their algorithm is uh, basically they do state action 
uh, space partitioning. So the, the first uh, partition uh, the state action space into uh, some discrete things. And, and so basically each uh, bunch of uh, state can be seen as one state. So the, the, so basically that will become a finite state action space. And then uh, <clears throat> they have a selection rule. Basically, uh, it's a greedy um, choosing the best uh, action for that state, for that uh, discretized state. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then update the count. Whenever the uh, ball is uh, chosen, we will uh, add the count. And when the ball is uh, chosen uh, many times, uh, we will refine the partition, meaning that we will uh, further split that uh, ball in the stage action space into uh, smaller uh, smaller balls. And the difference of uh, ADA, MD, and ADA QL is that uh, they evaluate the continuation reward differently. For ADA, MD, they, uh, it, the continuation reward is uh, estimated from the transition and reward kernels they, 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 they keep. So it's basically, uh, you can say that it's uh, first uh, estimate the model, and then um, and then based on those estimation, we we find the optimal reward. And for ADA QL, they they just keep the Q uh, function and value function. So I just have a few observation and some question. So uh, so actually in the in both of their algorithm they doesn't really require a uh, prior knowledge of the model, meaning that they, they don't need to know the reward and transition in advance. So for, for ADA Q, of course, it's a uh, model free. For ADA MB, they actually uh, estimate those reward and transition. So they, they don't have to know that uh, in advance. Uh, for second observation, I, <clears throat> I, uh, uh, <clears throat> make an analogy to the hierarchical bandit problem. So it's a little bit similar, but not uh, quite <clears throat> exactly. So in hierarchical bandit, the, um, the, the, there are different layers. And uh, uh, for each layer, there's the agent uh, choosing the arms. And the upper layer uh, agent will choose first, and then, and then the lower uh, layer agent. So in this setting, the best one is achieved uh, by uh, in, in a multi time scale manner, meaning that the, the upper layer will explore, will have to explore slower until uh, the lower layer uh, nearly finds the optimal sub arm. Uh, but here, uh, it's the same agent, right? And the upper layer sort of, uh, in some sense, re reflects the the reward for the lower sub arms. Oh, of course, I I think they they say you can um, arbitrarily sample. It doesn't really have to be uh, any sort of average. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and that 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 is uh, coming from the um, from the from from the intrinsic metric space. Um, to to guarantee that you 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 don't really need a uh, good average of that, and uh, if the upper arm is uh, explored sufficiently, basically uh, in the algorithm it means that that uh, that arm is good. So we will uh, further split that ball and then start to explore lower arms. The arms. So. My question is, uh, what if the um, such metric is not known in advance? For example, we have a, a large discrete state action space, and we don't have any knowledge of the transition or or reward or, or just no information for uh, of anything. So can we build a matrix from the history transition and reward such that uh, the the idea of your algorithm can still be applied. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks. This is a, a really great question. In fact, I've I also wondered the same thing. Uh, in fact, I don't actually don't have a um, I don't have a full answer for that. In that, uh, uh, it is true. Uh, key assumptions that we do need to know the metric. 
Um, and I would love to figure out how we can estimate the metri metric um, you know, in an online way as well from the history. I think that it would, my, my, my uh, hunch is that, um, that it would be that, that uh, in order to be able to, to estimate the metric, um, we would need an additional assumption beyond just, um, uh, just Lipschitz-Nitz and with, with no knowledge of any structure of the states in action space. So one, um, for example, one uh, assumption that I think might lead to some result is if you, if uh, let's say you knew structure in the action space, but you didn't know structure in the state space uh, or, or vice versa, then you might be able to use um, kind of uh, knowledge of the metric in one setting to kind of boost um, estimates for the metric and learning similarities in the other sense. Uh, otherwise, if it's large discrete and I know nothing in advance, uh, I still may need to incur, in order to even learn the metric itself, I still may need to incur um, cost that scales with the full size of the state in action space. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think it, I'm, I'm actually very uh, interested in that question as well. Um, and yeah, my only partial idea is really um, if you had a little bit of information, you could, you could kind of boost it. Uh, so that if I knew some very loose information in the action space, then I could use it to compare states and learn uh, and try to estimate um, similarity in the state space. But if I didn't know anything, I hesitate to think that uh, the cost of building the metric itself might be as costly as learning the optimal policy. Yeah. <laughs> then you might need, not, yeah. <laughs> and then you might not have anything to gain. So, um, I yeah, actually, I'm not sure what I'd anticipate whether it would be, uh, whether you would have something to gain or not. Thank you. Oh, another one example though, that people do look at this question is in assuming low rank uh, structure. So if you have a low rank structure, um, you know, you can think of that, uh, using that to build some, um, some, some um, I guess, estimates of relationship when, when the uh, space is very large. But the low rank uh, is a very different type of assumption that then uh, the may may not require a discretization approach anymore. Thank you, Christina. Thanks a lot. I think that was a. I think everyone enjoyed the talk a lot. So let me actually um, clap for you. I know it's a little hard to do it across. I really enjoyed. Um, well, I enjoyed the the questions too. And yeah. please. Please feel free to email if you want to chat more about it. I'd be happy to. Yeah, and so you're going to meet with a few people tomorrow. Sorry, right. I have a lot of noise coming. <laughs> All right. Uh, right, thanks again. So let's stop the seminar here. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah. All right, bye. Thank you.